In this episode of the Orange Nerd Show, we're talking all about Disney live action from the 90s. We're going to talk about our favorite movies from this era. We're going to talk about if Disney should get into making these kind of movies again. It seems like they really haven't really done this kind of film in a long time. It's been a lot of live action remakes. We're going to talk about it, break it down. We got Marion, the girly nerd, here with us today. First time on the channel. Up next on the Orange Nerd Show. Welcome aboard, everybody, to this episode of the Orange Nerd Show, where we talk about everything except the theme parks. Today, we're talking all about Disney live action from the 90s. From the 90s. It's going to be a really, really interesting conversation. Before we do, I'm going to introduce my fantastic panel. George the Italiano is back today. Uh, <laughs> has grown in significantly since yesterday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it goes in by the by the second, not even the minute. It's yeah. <laughs> we're we're on Beard Watch 2024, you know. <laughs> but George, if you could let everybody uh, at home know where they could find you on social media. Absolutely. You could find me on X, formerly known as Twitter at Disney George. You could also find me on Instagram under the Disney Italiano. And of course, you could find me here on my home base at Orange Grove 55 with Citrus Corner with all that sweet, juicy, but sometimes sticky. Disney news and info. There he is. There he is, Mr. Sticky Icky. And down below, first time on the channel, Marion, the girly nerd. Thank you so much for joining us today, Marion. Thank you. It's so nice of you to have me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. If you could let everybody at home know where they can find you on social media. You can find me on Twitter. I'm not going to call it X. Uh, <laughs> under the girly nerd. And on Instagram, under the girly nerd blog. Perfect, perfect. And I'll be linking all of her socials in the description in the description down below. So it'll be easy just to look at it, click it, and follow her on all her socials. And again, Marion, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you. So let's dive into our, our first topic today. So we're the whole show is gonna be about the Disney live action, but the first like subtopic, I guess you would call it, our favorite films from this era. Okay, so George. Your favorite, we'll, we'll do a few of these films, you know, because this era has a lot of good ones, uh, you know, 90s Disney live action. What so was for, one of your favorites? So one of my favorites is actually what is playing on behind me as we speak. It is mm -hmm. uh, the 1992 Disney film, The Mighty Ducks. And uh, I, this film was something like if you actually watch it, you would never really think it could be kind of under the Disney canon because they do have like some crude humor. Um, they have some mild language, but I think at that time that was like when Disney kind of let loose a little bit with, with some of their, their movies where it made it feel more organic, you know, it was something that it wasn't just kind of like tightly sugar coated, you know, it's like, Oh, cause it has to be kind of cutesy and everything, but they actually, uh, tackled, uh, kind of real life topics you know of how uh this uh attorney that was kind of like of a hot shot you know he was always always had to be you know winning you know based off of how he was with his childhood and and everything and then getting these group of kind of misfit kids together and and mm -hmm. creating a a team but not just a team but then they essentially became a family so uh, it's it, it had those disney Disney-fied qualities to it, but yet it kind of separated to what people would expect a Disney live action would be, especially in today's time era. Yeah, because Disney was kind of getting, like Michael Eisner, when he came in, he sort of, he, he understood the necessity of sort of like branching out. And that's why they created Touchstone pictures to do more of the like the edgier stuff right but even like you were saying george like things like the mighty ducks and things like that it was still a family movie for sure but maybe it had a little bit more of an edge than some of the older disney movies but yes mighty ducks is one of my favorites yes. too man it's a it's a great movie and i just have to say um especially coming from a person who loves to write the the writer of this film uh stephen brill i absolutely love his work he he wrote uh basically all of like the the mighty ducks he actually did cameos in every single one of the films oh cool um but he played different characters but he just kind of was in in the movie um so i thought that was kind of cool and stephen brill also wrote another disney uh live action film from the 90s uh heavyweights 
Oh, I remember that one. Yes. I remember that one. <laughs> now, now, Marion, what is what is what are your favorite um, live action Disney movies from that era? Um, well, I wrote like a top five, and then I wrote like a whole bunch. Uh, okay. But I will say I do. I also love the Mighty Ducks. Is not in my top five, but I do. I do love the Mighty Ducks. It is cute. Um, my brother and I loved it. You know, I grew up in a household where I kind of had to love sports because of my dad and my brother, um, and. And that's just a really cute movie. Uh, it's true. I, it is definitely edgier, but it's not like too edgy or anything like that. Um, but my favorite 90s live action is 100% The Rocketeer. Oh, um, nice. I love The Rocketeer so much. Like if I'm thinking like about my all time favorite, just playing Disney movies, not just live action 90s movies, The Rocketeer is like high up there. Um, Shout out to my friend Darren at Nostalgia Cast. Last year I did a podcast with him where we talked all about The Rocketeer. And uh, I, I've i always loved um, period films ever since I was really little. So, and that one's just so sweet and earnest and it kind of looks like it could have been made in the time it was set. And when was it set, Marion? It was in the 30s or the 40s? It was, the late, thir it was late, late 30s, yeah. And the thing I love about that movie, it, a lot, I like a lot of things about that movie. It's amazing. But, um, it, you know, this movie could actually, I think, do very well in today's kind of environment, right? Because it kind of almost reminds me a little bit of like a, almost like a superhero movie, right? I mean, it I guess is. it is, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and it takes, yeah. right, definitely superhero. And it takes place in, in, like you said, the 30s. So it kind of almost had like Captain America vibes um oh and 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 one of the best scores actually of any disney movie mm -hmm. of all time came from the rocketeer i you know? completely agree well it's funny the director of the rocketeer is the same director of captain america the first avenger so that's oh. why they felt yeah for sure and oh. i yeah i love the rocketeer score it's beautiful beautiful that's yeah. james horner james horner james. who also did he did titanic as well Okay. Okay. Yeah. So he's, he's, he's got, he's got a resume for yeah. sure. Oh, rest in peace though. He died. Abs that was so sad. I, heard but, yeah, I, lo I love the Rocketeer. It's, it's amazing. So yeah. funny. Uh, you know, a very like patriotic, but not in an annoying way. Just, you know, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. It's, it's like not in like a Homelander way from I no, know you guys watch. No. <laughs> it's a much more subdued, it, very Captain America y. It, it is. Yes, it, it, exactly. It's a, yeah. it's a great vibe, you know, for sure. Um, George, your thoughts on The Rocketeer? I have to agree. I absolutely love The Rocketeer. It's one of those films that I wish that they would make more of in today's time era, but it's just like, I don't know what it is. I, I don't mean to sound biased because I did grow up in the nineties. I was a nineties kid, but I, I swear like the nineties was like the sweet spot for like everything. It yeah. was a sweet spot for film, for music, for television. I don't know what it was about the nineties, but it was like that decade, like all these companies hit all the right notes. And honestly, the rocketeer was a, a, a simplistic part of like what makes great films. And a lot of people really don't talk about it anymore. I mean, us, you know, Disney nerds, you know, we, you know, we know about it all the time. But if you just right. go out to to a normie and you say uh, the Rocketeer, they're like, well, what are you talking about? What is that? And right. It's like and it's a shame, really, because I think a lot of people would enjoy the movies um, that that did come out in the 90s that, you know, kind of overlooked. And I think they need to bring more of that back. Yeah, absolutely. Now, my favorite is actually one of your favorites, George, is Mighty Ducks. I I love <laughs> that movie for so many. And it's weird, too, because I'm actually not a sports person. I don't watch sports at all. I have no idea who played the Super Bowl this year. Like, for, like I have no idea about any of the sports stuff. But it's like that movie, though, I just I thought the kids had great chemistry. You know, Emilio Estevez, right? Mm -hmm. um, great film. And I'll never forget it, too, because it was before the age of the Internet when because the internet kind of spoils everything i'll never forget it with it was connected to the movie but kind of not but my mom actually got me a hat for the mighty ducks hockey team um i think it was like for my birthday or something like that and it was around the time that movie came out maybe a little bit after 
and the hat had the logo for the hockey team on it, like the new lo the, the the logo for the official logo for the hockey team. And it was my first time seeing that logo, and I, I fell in love with that logo with the hockey mask with the duck bill and everything. I just absolutely love it, and I know it's not the movie technically, but I feel I feel like. I still feel it's connected, you know what I'm saying? Because it's the, the 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 team was based on the on the film, basically. But I fell in love with the logo. I love the movie. I love those kids. I thought it was fantastic. And they did like what, like two or three sequels, if I'm not mistaken, right? There was three movies altogether. Yeah, and I don't know that they, they kind of got. I think the first one was still my favorite. I don't think they yeah. got. Yeah, they kind of yeah. went a little bit. I, I actually like. <laughs> I like. I like. I like them actually in order. And then they did the Mighty Ducks Game Changers, I believe. It was the the series that they had on Disney+. Plus. That was... It was okay, but I do love how they brought Emilio Estevez back, you know, yeah. to reprise his role as Gordon Bombay. And then the one episode, they did bring a lot of the child actors back that are now adults, that they had a cameo in, in one of the episodes. But as far as the show as a whole... Uh, no. I watched one and I'm like, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> it, didn't it. it wasn't your thing. It, yeah. it, so, Mar Marion, it didn't it didn't capture the magic of the original. You don't think that show? No, no. I mean, I could have watched more, but I'm just like, eh, my time's precious, you know. <laughs> right. Yes. I'd exactly. Rather watch, not, I'd rather not struggle watching some, watching something. Yeah. 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 No, and, and that's the, and that's really the the predicament a lot of these studios are in right now is that there is it's it's an attention economy. Right. It's like the like trying to win over the eyeballs. Basically, we have so many options right now in our world, literally at our fingertips. And if something doesn't hit, it's like, you know, move on to the next thing. I could, I could watch Netflix. I could watch Hulu. I could, you know. And I do have to say now this isn't film, but I do find it quite interesting that they just released the um, the, the first two episode premiere of X-Men 97. And it actually ended up getting a full 100 percent on Rotten Tomatoes, which again, uh, you know, you don't have to necessarily like take the Rotten Tomatoes as the Bible. Like that's going to like, you know, say like exactly, but I mean, it got a full 100% and it's been getting a lot of praise lately of how literally the animation mm -hmm. on that, it, it segues so well from back in the nineties to where the story last left off. It's like, they said it's completely seamless where it's like you, you can't even tell the difference it just picked up right where it left off yeah and they were talking about it where it was like um it was done pretty traditionally the hand-drawn animation they they said they did use some computer animation for more complicated set pieces or whatever in the film you know but i mean in the show but for the most part it's animated pretty old school and you can tell right it feels like a like a 90s show Yes. I mean, they captured that magic perfectly, I think. I, at least from what I've seen. I haven't watched the show yet, but I've seen a lot of clips on Twitter and, um, and, and, and what have you. But, um, Marion, have you, have you seen that show, The X-Men 97 on Disney Plus no, yet? No, no. I'm not, I'm not big into that. I mean, I do like Marvel movies and stuff, but um, I never really watched uh, animated things like that. Okay. All right. Now, what, what's another one on your list, Marion, in terms of your favorite 90s uh, live um, action? Second favorite is one a lot of people don't know. It's called Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken. Oh, okay. okay I've, he I, I've heard of it. It sounds familiar. I don't know if I've seen it, though. So, basically, it stars um, Gabrielle Anwar, which most people know as Fiona on Burn Notice, mm. and uh, Cliff Robertson, who played uh, uh, Uncle Ben and Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man. He's nice. in it. Okay. Then I forget the actor's name, but he was in 16 Candles. Um, so that takes place during the 20s, during the Great Great Depression. And it's about an orphan girl who she runs away from home because she's living with her aunt. And her aunt wants to um, send her send her away to like this other like place because she's like too difficult or something. And it's just like she just doesn't like always respect authority but she's a good, she's a good kid i think i don't know how old she's supposed to be probably like 17 maybe 16 17 and she goes to this state fair and she sees this show about um a girl who mounts a running horse running up this ramp and then dies into a tank of water and it's, oh. a, re it's a real story it's about a real woman and uh and so she's like i want to do that so I'll do whatever it takes to be a, a diving girl. And 
she works really hard and then she become she becomes like a star and then something terrible happens and i don't want to spoil it but it does have a very very happy ending it's just a really really beautiful little movie and it had like a shoestring budget and it it looks fantastic you would never know it had a small budget and i don't i don't know if it did very well but it's a movie I remember seeing in the movie theater. I would watch it over and over again because I recorded it on the Disney Channel. Um, it's just very, very sweet and inspiring and, you know, kind of one of those, you know, feel good movies about like overcoming something. I think it's interesting how even back in the day when you have a low budget film that's being made sometimes those are the the great ones you know mm -hmm. sometimes when you have like an over budget where you kind of get overly confident to say oh i got all this technology at my fingertips <laughs> because i got a big budget sometimes it doesn't come out the way you think it is and it's like something as small budget those are sometimes the better ones yeah. you, you, and you if, never if know that one is on disney plus you can watch that one on some of them are on there but i i checked and that one is on there it's it's, it's really it's really wonderful and that's called Wild Hearts Can't Be Broken, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll check yeah, it out. I don't want to spoil what happens. Okay. I'll check it out. I'll check it out. Uh, George, another one. What, what, what do you feel? I, what, what are you, are you, are you going to say Kidding King Arthur's Court? Or what? Yeah. <laughs> Which I actually, I actually do enjoy that movie, believe it or not. Um, but for me, this is a movie that's under the Touchstone banner. And it's actually Sister Act. Oh, okay. <laughs> Another movie from 1992 um, starring Whoopi Goldberg. I don't know. something about this movie that the type of comedy that it is, it's like y y you think you take the whole synopsis of a film and you're going to say, you know, I'm going to put in a Las Vegas lounge singer into a convent with a bunch of nuns and <laughs> let's see how that goes. Let's see how that works for you. And it's like of how you can kind of take someone who is a Las Vegas headliner and you take – a, a choir a church choir of nuns and you kind of you, you you mesh that together where it's like the nuns can't really sing well they don't know how to uh you know harmonize you know their 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 tones or you know whatever the the terminology is i'm not a music <laughs> major by all means but but it's like you bring whoopi goldberg in and she kind of turns these church hymns into like these kind of like upbeat rock and roll kind of <laughs> kind of uh kind of showstopper sort of speak and again with the, the comedy tie into like having her hide out in the convent because uh her boyfriend is trying to find her and 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 kill her and everything so it's like you get all that together and uh, again brilliant performance by Whoopi Goldberg, Kathy and Jimmy, uh Maggie Smith uh, Harvey Keitel, you know, it's a, a great ensemble cast. And I enjoy the second one, uh, Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit, but the first one is is my favorite. Is S-tier S -tier entertainment? It's top tier? <laughs> yeah, top tier. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Marion, what do you think about uh, Sister Act? Sister Act's cute. I haven't seen it in a really, really long time. But I remember liking it, yeah. It's nice. Okay. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, my 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 second one is gonna be "Honey, I Blew Up the Kid." Oh, I um, love that. <laughs> I I love I love that movie. I thought it was a cool little sequel. I used to, back in the day, back then, I had like a big crush on Carrie Russell, who was on the Mickey Mouse Club, <laughs> with her big curly hair. You know, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. And she was in that movie. She was in that movie. But I I love that franchise overall. You know, the "Honey, I Shrunk the Audience" franchise. I think it was really really clever. Love I love Rick Moranis. I wish he would get. I know he quit acting. He hasn't really been involved in years, but I wish Disney can kind of bring him back, you know, and, 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 uh, may, you know, we're going to talk about it, but maybe they, if they could bring Rick Moranis back and make some live action Disney studios films with him in it. Oh, come on, Disney. What I think is funny about Rick Moranis is obviously he was a well-known actor back in his time. Yeah. Uh, the generation today, if he, they wouldn't know Rick Moranis, but I think it's funny that any kind of movie that he was in, was wildly popular you know the the honey i shrunk the kids franchise uh little shop of horrors oh that was so good dude i mean come on it's like ghostbusters. Uh, ghost ghostbusters it's like like he, even if his character was very subtle he was always in something that was very successful in its own right 
he just had this like really nerdy, lovable charm to him. He was kind of like Tom Staggs, you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it. I like it. So, um, uh, Marion, what what's what's another one that you enjoyed from the nineties? Well, uh, just to stay on that topic, I love that movie too. It's so cute. <laughs> um, I love Honey I Shrunk the Kids uh, as well. I think that's from the eighties, though. Um, I, I've I have this like I've always had this strong sort of like maternal instinct so anything with like a cute little kid i'm gonna like <laughs> and the little boy in yeah and honey i blew up the kid is just the cutest thing ever he's so adorable so i i love that movie and because it's hilarious when he's huge <laughs> and they're trying to like play the hokey pokey and and he's banging on the floor <laughs> like an earthquake. i i have to say that out of all three of those films the second one was the very last one I watched because as a young kid, when I saw the title, Honey, I Blew Up the Kid, I was afraid yeah. to watch it because I literally thought yeah. they were going to blow up the kid. And I'm like, that's a weird title. <laughs> oh, it's funny. I don't think, you know, I've never seen the third one. Honey, no, Honey, we shrunk ourselves. Yeah, I never saw that yeah. one. But um, my, my third favorite is another one no one knows. And I don't think it's anywhere that you can stream, and it's so sad that you can't. Um, it's called A Far Off Place. Oh, okay. I've heard of it. I've heard of it. So that's with uh, Reese Witherspoon. So it's not like it has like a rinky deep cast. It, yeah, it's with Reese Witherspoon when she's very young. And um, do you know who Ethan Embry is? I do. Oh, yes, yes. Ethan oh, yeah. Embry. He. Uh, he played um, Rusty a, in in Vegas yeah. Vacation, yeah, and he also yeah, played he, the bass player in that thing you do. Yes, yes. So he, it's this, it's the two of them, and Ethan. <laughs> How do you know that, George? <laughs> I know, I know it. I love Ethan yeah. um, but so he's traveling with his father to Africa, and Reese Witherspoon lives on a like this animal preserve with her family. And uh, so that's a, this is a very serious movie. So their parents, I, I, I'm sort of spoiling it, but their parents get killed by um, poachers. And they have to flee across the desert for their lives, basically, is what this movie is about. So it's not like typical Disney because it's very, very serious. There is like humor in the movie, um, but it's definitely darker and... Like at, at you even see like her father like on the floor dead with kind of like blood and stuff. It's very quick, but and the beginning of the movie opens with um, a simulation of just in case anyone wants to watch this, um, a simulation of elephants being killed and like their tusks being um, sawed off. It's like heinous and uh. really really disgusting. And uh, but it's it's a really really um, kind of uplifting movie um you know them trying to survive you know and walk toward um this place in africa called carlstown because that's where safety will be and they have a um like a local local uh bushman helping them across the desert and it's it's really beautiful and uh yeah it's a great movie and no one remembers it i, I remember seeing i i remember the name and I, I remember seeing, I think, like um, commercials for it on Disney Channel. Yeah, it probably aired on Disney Channel. Um, I'm pretty sure I recorded it, you know, before DVDs and stuff. But I think, I think it also is like Amblin Ember Entertainment, which is, I think is Steven Spielberg. I think mm -hmm. it's that as well. So it's maybe not strictly Disney, but it is Walt Disney Pictures. Um, but I looked for it the other day and. Yeah, it's not on Disney Plus. I don't think it's streaming anywhere. Like you can't even rent it, which is wow. weird. Um, you can buy the DVD. I know that because I have it. It's like sitting I, right behind. I wonder if there's like some legal legalese there because, like you said, it's, it's it's Amblin too. So yeah. there might be some like weird, you know. That's interesting. Now another one I loved. I don't know. Do you do you guys ever see the Three Musketeers? Yes. Oh yes. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> that love was a good that movie. movie. Love that movie. Love that movie. Oh, so good. And the sound. I think I love the movie, but I think I even like the soundtrack even more. I think the oh, music, yeah. the songs. Yeah. I just, I loved it. Yeah, especially um, with Brian Adams, uh, yeah. Sting, and Rod Stewart. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, like all three of them together. That's I, like, what was that song called? It was All for One, I think. All one for all. Or yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. It was fantastic. Fantastic. So you, you were a fan of that one, uh, George? Oh, I love that movie. I could honestly, it's one of, it's one of the movies that I very rare. Can I find a movie that I could watch and rewatch literally over? That is actually a movie that I have done uh, where I watched it and then rewatched it again. Wow. Wow. What are your thoughts on that one, uh, Marion? It's been a while since I've seen it, but I do remember liking it. I think Gabrielle Anwar is in that too, right? Isn't she like the a queen or a princess or something? Oh, you know what? I think you're right. I think she is. Like a small part, but um, yeah, yeah, like a yeah, small part. But yeah, yeah it's that's a fun one. Yeah, I I like that they completely ignore like accents and stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and I'm sorry. And and Tim Curry, bless his oh. heart. I know, like he can't act. You know as well as he he can but he's always a good villain if, if you yeah. needed a villain tim curry was your actor he's it's your like, guy fantastic and um okay so i think i'm up now george and then i'll go to marion your next one so for me um this this was a movie that was based off of a true story um but it, the way that they kind of went about doing it they kind of threw in that that comic kind of but it it was a it was an underdog story to say the least and I'm a huge fan of Cool Runnings. I love Cool Runnings. I, yeah. I can't go wrong with John Candy. I mean, anything that he was in, I mean, was pure acting gold. And then, of course, the just the story behind, as I said, like that true underdog story yeah. of how the, these the kind of again, I always, I always like root for the underdogs. Like you get these <laughs> these group of misfits together, and it's like you, you think that they can't you know, they start from nothing and they become something like, I love a good story. And I think all the more that I geared toward this was because it was based off of a true story, but you know, they kind of put it into their own with well, you know, with some comedic, you know, timing and everything. But again, it's, it's one of those movies. It's a feel good movie. It's an underdog story. I love, I love cool runnings. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Marion? Cool runnings. I love cool runnings. Uh, yeah. Again, it's been a while, but um, it's so, it's so fun. Yeah, I love I love John Candy. John Candy's wonderful and everything. Um, he was a national treasure, very much missed. Um, yeah, I remember yeah. Cool Runnings is one my uh, brother would always quote to me in in the Jamaican accent to make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> nice. you, you know, you're right. You're absolutely right. You both are absolutely right about John Candy. Um, what a legend, you know. And um, I used to love the. I don't know if you guys remember the cartoon that he had. I think it was in the '90s or maybe the '80s. Camp Candy. No. You might, I don't, you don't, I don't, that one. Oh, okay. There was a cartoon called Camp Candy, and it was like a like a summer camp for kids, and and he was like the counselor or whatever. It was, a, it was like Saturday morning stuff, yeah. basically. Uh, okay. You know? I remember the movie he did, okay. Summer Rental. Was it Summer uh, Rental? There was a movie called Summer Rental. This was, I think, that was in the '80s, and I think that was, if memory serves me correctly, that was one of Joey Lawrence's first movies of the Lawrence Brothers. Which, again, part of the '90s, I watched Brotherly Love. I watched Boy Meets <laughs> World. I absolutely love the Lawrence Brothers. They do their Brotherly Love podcast now. Anyone <laughs> check it out because they're very entertaining, and it's like of how close they are, like as brothers, and how they. They treat each other like brothers, but yet they treat each other like their best friends. And it's honestly, I was always a fan of theirs. So, absolutely, Marion, what's your what's your next one? What's your next pick? Um, Santa Claus. Oh, okay, with Tim Allen. Yeah, of course. Yeah, <laughs> I Tim love the Santa Claus. I do yes. not like the sequels at all. Thank you. Um, Thank um, you. Yes, I, I, they are very very painful, and it makes me <laughs> sad. But the original one, the original one is beautiful and fantastic and funny and. It's like the second one lost all the heart, all the mm -hmm. heart and all the charm. And the third one, eh, even with Martin, even I love Martin Short, but I'm like, eh. so but, I don't, I don't watch those, but, but I rewatch the Santa Claus every single year. So Christmas movies are like one of my favorite things. So I love Christmas. I'm a Christmas girl. So I've seen Christmas movies, you know, every year for as long as they've come out. So I've seen that one a lot because I watch it every single year. I'll quote it when I'm watching it. I'm one of those annoying people. You know, if you watch a movie with me, I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't help it. <laughs> but it, it's funny that you say that, Miriam, because it's, I remember, I think it was Tim Allen that said it, and he said everything that we wanted to do in the first one, 
we couldn't do because of budgets and because of the technology that they were able to do in the second and the third. And I'm thinking in my head, that's why the first one is so great because it was like, it was very subtle and it was yeah. more human like than, than toy quality, if you will. Like it's about it, him and his son. That's yes. Important for them it was, it was so, it was human. It was so yeah. human that, that you can relate to, you know, a father trying to, you, you know, rekindle that relationship with his son to gain that acceptance by becoming Santa Claus and, and gaining that responsibility back and everything. And it had that heart where, yeah, I, I agree with you that the second and the third, and then the, the Santa Claus is that the show on Disney plus. Oh gosh. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, is it that? I haven't watched it. Uh, you don't need to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I absolutely love the Santa Claus. I actually, I was four years old when i saw it for the first time in theaters and uh, even as a four-year-old i caught on to it quick and it was it was one of my favorite movies of 1994 along with the lion king yeah. now, now as, as a four-year-old did you have a beer back then too george <laughs> yeah I, yeah the, the mustache was coming in quite nicely <laughs> it's like i can relate <laughs> i can see little baby george with a little full, full grown beard you know <laughs> uh, so so we'll do one more round of, of favorite movies and we'll move on to our next topic my next one, because I am a huge dog lover. I have two little dogs at home, which I was having some issues with my doggies, medical issues, scary medical issues, but they are good now. And I, okay. I want to thank everybody that reached out and stuff on Twitter. And um, and, and our friend, maybe has been really um, amazing through that whole thing too. But yeah, it, it, thankfully they're out, out of the woods and they're healthy now, but it was, it was scary for a little while, a rough couple of weeks, but long story short, I love animals. So, one of my favorite 90s movies is Homeward Bound. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Homeward Bound. I mean, it was just, it's a great feel-good movie. It feels, it's its like you were saying, George, with with the Disney, with the 90s, there was this, there was this perfect kind of like, there was like this balance in the force, so to speak, where it was like the movies were very much the 90s, you know? But they had like an old school quality to them at the same time. And the animation did too, you know? Like when you look at a movie like, say, Lion King, it feels for something that you you could maybe watch in Walt's era. But it also had a foot in the future and felt very fresh. Same with like Beauty and the Beast, right? So a lot of these live action movies had the same kind of quality. Homeward Bound felt like an old school Walt Disney movie. It really did. But it also felt very 90s, very Michael Eisner, you know? It was yes. that perfect thing, but it was an adorable movie. Um, and, I loved and it. And especially at the end when the animals reunite with the kids, oh. I always get a lump in my throat, but for a good reason. Like, I just like want to just tear up because it's like you, you got that sentimental moment where you see the animal running towards the kid, the kid running towards the animal. And it's just like, how could your heart not melt for something like that? I, I have such a weakness for, for like dogs. Like I can't, like if I see like a movie where like a dog gets hurt, that hits me worse than like a human being. I don't know. I can't watch it. It's so hard to watch. It's really, really hard to watch. I get really emotional with animals. But uh, Miriam, did you love um, this movie, Homeward Bound? Oh, I love Homeward Bound. You know, what I like about it is that um, it's something they don't do anymore, and I wish they did. I like that the it's just real animals, and they don't like animate their facial features to make it look like right. they're talking. I'm like, I don't need that. I believe that, that they're talking to each other without without that. Right. And it, it's just like, there's nothing like real animals that are well-trained and, and stuff. I understand maybe that's probably more expensive, but uh, it it's worth it. I think that movie is so sweet. I recently rewatched it. I had to do an article about uh, 90s Disney movies. And yeah, I was crying at the end. And it's so sweet. And I've never... Uh, unfortunately, I've never been lucky enough to have a pet because oh. I grew up in a place that um, I grew up in an apartment. They, di they didn't allow dogs. And uh, my mother and brother are allergic to cats. So <laughs> and now, you know, I don't believe you should have a pet unless you can properly take care of it, you know, monetarily. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the reason I, I don't want have one. Um, I would love I would love a dog. I love yeah. dogs. They're so sweet. If I see a dog outside, I'm like, oh, puppy. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They're very sweet. They're they're family. They become the family. And it's just, it's, it's, um, 
Yeah, it's but you're right though, Marion. I mean, you have to be able to 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 commit to it, you know, like financially and stuff. And they're expensive. Yeah. Believe me, with all the medical stuff that I've been going through with your, it is. I mean, when when they are sick or anything like that, and things go south like that, I mean, it, it can get very very pricey. And it's financially draining. It's emotionally draining. It's hard. So yeah, it's it's a big commitment, a very big commitment. But I do. Yeah. I love the movie. I love the voice work in that movie. Like yes. Michael J. Fox is great. Sally Field's great. Uh, Donna Michi is great. Uh, it's just such a, yeah, it's just such a sweet movie. I love the part where they find the little girl who's lost in the woods. Yes. And yes. it's just this instinctual thing between the, uh, what's the golden retriever? What's uh, Shadow? Shadow. Shadow. It's just that moment. Oh, it just gets to me. It's just so sweet. Um, yeah, animals are animals are amazing because the way they can sense things. Yes, absolutely. It's just incredible. It's just incredible. Yeah, I love Homer Bound. It wasn't my number <laughs> five, but it's one. It is one I wrote down. It's, I wrote down five, and then I wrote down a whole bunch. It's 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 funny. Uh, a coworker of mine, her daughter, always says this quote: "Why do I deal with people on a daily basis when I have my dogs?" <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> no, exactly. Exactly. Now, now the Italiano, what's your number? What's your next one? So my next one is, uh, now I know we'll probably, we'll dive into it in a little bit. So this, I'm going to be a little bit biased with this because this is a, a Disney live action remake, but of how that they did it was completely different in the way than how they do the remakes today. And it was, the 1996 live action version of 101 Dalmatians with Glenn Close. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I, I love that rendition of how realistic that they made it where they didn't necessarily have to make the animals talk to, to know how they were feeling, what they were going through. And it made it more realistic, but you could still follow along the storyline and Glenn Close. She was a phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, Cruella like right. she she you know hit it out of the ballpark with that and I actually uh was lucky enough I got to see a lot of the set pieces uh on on the uh the sound stage down it when it was Disney MGM Studios they used one of the sound stages where they set up part for the um like the uh the animation tour and everything that they took us into where you could actually walk the sound stage and actually get a glimpse of the set pieces that they used in the film and then you can kind of go behind like where the glass was where the uh the jim henson's workshop worked on the audio animatronics of some of the puppies and how they got them to work and everything it was really cool that's awesome. That's awesome. Great. Yeah, that's that is actually a, pr a, a pretty good live action remake. And that was that's funny. They were doing them back then, even. I mean, yeah. it's it's not people think it's kind of a new thing. It really isn't. I mean, they, they did that. And they also did Flubber was technically a live action a remake. live action remake after and the absent minded professor. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah, and Parent Trap. And Parent Trap, and Parent I think Trap. they did. I, I think they did a that darn cat remake, too. Right. Oh, the they night? did with Christina yeah. Ritchie. Right. No. I didn't like the movie, but I watched it to watch Christina Ricci. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, now Marion, what are your thoughts on the 101 Dalmatian uh, Glenn oh, Close movie? It's cute. It's cute. It's, you're right. Glenn Close is fantastic. That's like one of her best, best roles. She's just, it's so, it's so hammy and over the top, but that's what makes it so wonderful. And uh, yeah, I like that it's all real dogs and yeah, you don't need to hear them talking and, and everything. That's a sweet, that's a sweet movie. Yeah, I yeah. like Jeff Daniels a lot in it too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I actually I saw that one at the El Capitan actually. Oh. When when okay. when I was when I was younger, I we went there like we went there all the time. Like my my mom and my grandma would take me there for like a lot of the animated stuff. I was always a Disney nerd like I mean since I was little. And so we would go there for all the animation, sometimes for the bigger event films for like, you know, stuff like that. So yeah, that was one we saw over there. It was pretty cool. Pretty cool. Now, Marion, what is your what is your last and final favorite uh, '90s era Disney live action? Uh, well, before I I say that one, I just want to quickly just list all these other ones. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I had a top five, and then I listed a whole bunch of other ones. So I the other ones I listed are Shipwrecked, White Fang, Iron Will, George of the Jungle, Angels in the Outfield, Newsies, Homeward Bound, Adventures of Huck Finn, Operation Dumbo Drop, The Mighty Ducks, Cool Runnings. Muppet Christmas Carol and Parent Trap. So that just shows 
how fantastic the 90s were. Yes. M Muppet Christmas Carol is one of the best Christmas movies of all time. Yeah. But my number five is Hocus Pocus. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, nice. Love nice. Hocus Pocus. Yeah, watch it every year. Yeah. Did, so, no, did you see the new one that came yeah, out? I was just going to ask you, what do you think I, of the sequel? I did, and I did not care for it. It was, uh, it was not terrible. It's not like the worst thing ever. It was just, eh, I don't know. I don't, I don't do, even know do how you, to describe it. I just didn't like it that much. Do you think because of the popularity of, of such movies that make comebacks, which Hocus Pocus is one of them, and I mm -hmm. feel like the Sanders, Sanderson sisters kind of revived from a lot of the, the uh, Halloween parties and events that they added to the parks, so they br came back in a big way. So it's like, okay, well, maybe we need a sequel for this. But do you think as much as of a popular uh, of a film, it, because it became basically a cult classic, and the characters of the Sanderson sisters, sometimes it's just like, Leave the classic as a classic. You don't yeah. need to continue on. Especially since, you know, they turned to dust. They had to come up with some weird way to bring them back, you know, make it make sense. And they had none of the original cast besides them in it. And uh, and the original, yeah, is what... It's good because of the, the brother and sister, you know, relationship. Mm -hmm. And and his... Uh, well, not his girlfriend, but almost girlfriend. And... Um, I think what I didn't like in the sequel was, you know, they're fi they're funny, they are, but they're you know they're the bad guys, and at the end of the sequel, they were almost trying to make them kind of sympathetic, um, and I'm like, yeah. no, you know, they want to kill children, you know, yeah. it, this this whole thing, it's like, oh, every villain needs like to have a redemption story, and it's like that's fine sometimes, but. You don't have to always do that. And I think that's just one of the reasons I didn't like it. There's other reasons, too. It just didn't have the same feeling. But I know the original one, yeah, is a little dark at the beginning, like with the little girl just sitting there dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's just a fun, it's just a funny movie. I watch it every Halloween. It's one of it's uh, certain movies me and my mom like to watch together. And that's that's one of them. Yeah. And and for all of you who don't know, but you probably know that if you are a huge fan of NCIS and you see Special Agent McGee, that is uh Thackeray Binks in the beginning of the movie yeah. as human form. So Yeah. I oh that. wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah hocus pocus i mean that's and and you know that's a big franchise now kind of because that that movie that that recent movie did very well on disney plus and they really utilize them too in the parks during halloween mm -hmm. um, at least out here at disneyland resort for like the uh, oogie boogie bash things like that so it's still a very popular franchise you know so i think yeah. that's nice i uh, it's nice to have um live action characters in parks because that very rarely happens i feel like live action movies kind of get the short end of the stick as far as like park um visibility i mean there's like mary poppins and bert and jack sparrow and i think that's it <laughs> pretty much <laughs> pretty much I you don't get very much I, unless i'm forgetting someone um i can't think of anything else yeah, no, you're absolutely right. They don't, and that's why it's it's a rarity. It really is a rarity. Um, so it's good to see. It absolutely is good to see, and they're and they're great characters. So it's fun. Now, okay, so there's obviously a ton of great live action Disney movies in the '90s. It was a great era uh, for Disney on so, on so many levels. But Disney now, their live action stuff, you know, look, there's some gems in there for sure, you know. But for the most part, I don't know. For me personally, it, it, they, they kind of f have fallen short, right? Um, I feel like a lot of the creativity isn't really there like it was in the 90s. It's a lot of remakes and things like that. George, do you think Disney needs to get back to making these sort of like, they're not big budget movies. Like, uh, you know, I mean, you know, um, a lot of these movies are, are, are smaller budgets, right? Which might be good for the times right now with Disney trying to cut back a little bit. Um but they kind of have that wholesomeness to it, the Disney wholesomeness to it. Should they bring these kind of films back, not remake them, but right. this kind of film, like what they used to do then should Disney studios get away from the live action remakes and kind of try to do stuff like this again for family entertainment. Absolutely. Yeah. They definitely should kind of pull back on the, the live action remakes of the Disney animated films and go into more uh, original content for live action. But when they do, kind of get off of that kind of uh sugar-coated candy crush kind of 
Disney-fied to it, where it's like everything has to be cutesy, so to speak. I love something where it it can be cute, I, but I love the realism in it, where it's like, you know, if there is some crude humor and mild language, let it be, but let it come organically, let it come naturally, because that's what it is in Cool Runnings, that's what it's in The Mighty Ducks, that's even what it's in the Santa Claus, honestly, you you get right. a lot of that, you know, crude humor where it's like he goes up and he says, they all look like they have key Lyme disease to the reindeer. <laughs> it's like, you know, you, you can never get, I mean, that's just classic Tim Allen, but it's like, but I mean, you don't get like a lot of that, that great uh, writing content in the, in these, in these films anymore. And I think Disney should really go back in their, their library and kind of look back to say, you know, maybe we should kind of take this you know, into a new look. Cause we briefly talked about uh, X-Men 97 where they kind of went back to go forward. And it's like, because they did that, I wish that they would do that with more live action films moving forward. Yeah. And you're creating new franchises when you, when you do these kind of small budgety films, like a cool runnings or a homeward bound or whatever, or, um, well, actually, not Homeward Bound. I take that back because that is actually – that's not an original, I don't believe. I think there was a 1960s version of that. Yeah. Okay, but like Cool Runnings or like Sister Act or Hocus Pocus, you know, these live action – these great live action Disney films. Um, you create new franchises, you know what I'm saying? So you can – we've talked about Hocus Pocus. Now they're now utilizing it in the parks and what have you. They just have a – they just had a hit sequel on Disney+. Plus. It's like – if Disney were to do that, you're creating new IP where with these live action remakes, you're not creating anything new. You're just remaking an existing IP that was already popular, you, you know? And, um, I think it's a smart idea. And I think right now, I think Disney could utilize something like this because they are smaller budgeted movies. You know, these films are not, you know, like a star Wars movie or a Marvel movie or anything like that. It's a, these are low budget movies. Um, but they have that wholesome Disney vibe to them. They're fun. It's it's original, right? I'm all for it. I think they should. I think they. I think Disney Studios should start dipping into that that kind of stuff, and that gives Disney Studios its own little identity now. When you put it up against a thing like Star Wars, you put up against a thing like you know Marvel, these other live action studios that they have under the Disney umbrella. It gives it its own identity, and uh, I don't know. I think it's smart. I think they. I wish they would go back to that to that formula. But uh, Marion, what do you think? Should should, should they uh, should they get back to this kind of style no, of absolutely. movie? Absolutely. Yeah. A hundred percent. When I was looking at all the movies, like the list of them, the thing I liked best was how much var variety there was. So they had like, you know, these sort of period movies that were dramas, you know, very inspiring, or they had like the modern day comedies that still had heart. And, and even like, even into the early 2000s that they were still making movies like that because they had like, remember the Titans and, and, you know, National Treasure and stuff like that, which I love those movies. Um, all, yeah, all the sport movies, all the Pirates movies, National Treasure movies had the same sort of feel as um, the, the 90s movies. And, and you know, they had a few remakes in there and that, that's fine. Um, it's that it's they just, they're not just doing one thing. You know, they have original stories and, you know, things that were based on real people or... And yeah, like like you were saying, George, they are not too cutesy. You know, a lot of the ones I like, they're um, they have some dark stuff in them, but it's okay to have that in that in a movie that's you know for families. You don't have to you know pretend everything's all sunshine and rainbows all the time. I watched this stuff when I was young, and I was fine, and I'm very sensitive. So you know, like a far off place is very dark, but it's. It's good. It's not like so dark where it's going to like absolutely traumatize, traumatize you or anything like that. It's, it's good to, you know, expose children to, you know, sometimes the world is harsh, but you can overcome something really, really horrible and dark and stuff. And, you know, in the Rocketeer, they're, you know, they're fighting Nazis. That's very, uh, very dark. So, I mean, it, it's in a very kind of, it's a lighthearted movie, but the, the setting was anything but, but uh, I think the problem is I think they're afraid to like take risks mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, they go, well, let's just make a, you know, a remake because we know people like the original. Right. But, exactly. 
it's totally a risk thing. And I agree. I'm glad you brought that up, Marion, where it's like, I, I've been saying it for a long time too, where it's like, they should not, they should not talk down to their audience. I think children can handle darker themes. Yeah. I mean, look at Walt Disney was doing it back like with Bambi, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And even Bambi's Dumbo. Too. But what, Bambi's what one of the most beautiful movies ever made. And it's so yeah. like powerful in a, in a very, very simple way. Which I I really I miss not to go off on a tangent, but I miss animated movies like that, like the style and the way the story is. I'm really tired of movies with, um, regardless of what the setting is, is all you know these um, modern jokes in them. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Oh, I know what you mean. It's been a yeah. few. I, I'm with you 100, percent Marion. I I have the same problem with that stuff that's why i'm not a fan of the minions because it's like this kind of like a joke every five seconds and the and there's farting and stuff in it yeah. and it's like i like like the old school like bambi it's like it's it's art you know what i'm saying yeah. it's it's beautiful um dumbo is another one a very emotional darker movie but it's like god these are such beautiful films you know and a lot of animation now it's like the, i think these studios are so afraid oh the, the, there's like there's like two minutes of like something not happening. We got to throw a joke in there, you know? It's like, I, I wish they'd get off of that. Yeah, I really do. And Disney's kind of falling into that trap a little bit too. And I don't like that trend. What do you think, George? Yeah, I definitely agree. Uh, yeah, when I was younger, I used to watch a whole lot of stuff that, you know, people today would think it's disturbing or, you know, misunderstood. And it's like, you know, I, I turned out, of, well, Okay, maybe I'm not the best uh, qualified, <laughs> but, but yeah, but I mean, I, I turned out all right. It's like people, you know, you think that, you know, these kids are so super sensitive to things, which, yeah, th there's nothing wrong with being sensitive to it, but that, that shows the human quality side of you. You know, you, you're allowed to feel emotions. You're allowed to feel sad. You're allowed to feel angry. You're allowed to feel uh, happiness. And it's like, let all those emotions come out based off of these films. These films do not have to be just a one tone safe track. It's like, let, let the needle go up and down a little bit. That's, that's right. what makes it. That's what brings the realism out in cinema. Well, yeah, it brings a realism. And Walt Disney understood this. He, he understood that you're going to have to grab the parents too. You know, it's not just the kids you're going to have to talk to. You're going to talk to the adults as well. Right. Cause the adults have the money, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he even said that, you know, but, um, yeah, I just I, I wish they would kind of get back to that. Um, it, it is a risk thing. It, it, I think they're scared to do this, and uh, I don't know why. And here's the other thing too: it's like when it comes to this stuff, like whether you talk about like maybe like the violence and like Looney Tunes, right? You know, those the little Looney Tune cartoons were freaking hilarious. You know what I'm saying? And you have stuff like that, and a lot of that stuff now is kind of taboo. But they're they're afraid that kids are going to try to imitate or whatever. Look, here's the thing. That, that's a parenting thing, though, I think, in my opinion. Like, I think, like, I, I grew up on Looney Tunes, and I saw all that violence. I didn't grow up to be a serial killer or nothing like that. You know what I'm saying? I, I was, I'm not a violent person at, at all, you know? And it's like, it's a, parent, a parenting thing. I think, it, you know, it's okay for the for kids to, to to watch this content as long as you have a good, a good household, I guess. But I guess not every person is blessed with a good household. So I, I understand that, but I don't know. I don't mind these darker themes. I, I think a lot of the animation now is so sanitized. It loses it. It's, you know, it's just not the same. Yes. So we'll I, I was talking with someone um, where they were saying, you know, sometimes parents think, you know, their kids are going to be bored uh, of something or, you know, like showing something. Oh, it's, oh, it's period. You know, they're, they're, they're going to find it boring or stupid or something. And I'm like, if you expose it to them when they're young enough, they don't know any better. So, you know, I watched these things that were, you know, period things very, very young, and I love them. I mean, not every kid is the same, but uh, I think if you, you get them young enough, it, it can work. Um, and we were talking about so many of the, the things that children watch these days are very, very hyper. Yes. And mm -hmm. um, chaotic, and there's nothing slow and calm. And if that's all they're exposed to, that's what they're used to. And then they expect everything to be like that. So when you try to show them something that's maybe a little slower, they get fidgety and then they can't, they can't, uh, you know, sit still or pay attention to it because you've already, you've already lost them. You need to expose something different to them earlier. Like, you know, Mr. Rogers, you know, I feel so sorry for children who don't 
no, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Oh, because man. he was the most, he was the sweetest soul on the planet. And he taught you about your emotions. And it was just a very calm, he had a very calming presence. I, I got and, to meet him. I had the opportunity to oh, meet him. Oh, you got him. to meet him? Oh, my yes, God. Yes, he actually uh, didn't live too far from oh. the outskirts of Pittsburgh. And he would always go downtown is where his um, film studio was. And I actually got to tour it. And believe it or not, his the house, like the setting, is basically a pan box, uh, like in the studio. It was like so like tightly like made but i mean the way that they shot it with the camera it made it look so wide but i tell you what being in his presence everything you saw in in front of that camera every day when he would invite you in his house and his make-believe neighborhood everything you saw of that man is exactly who he was as a human being yeah. and it's like you could just read it in his aura like when you're around him you could just see like that golden sun like above his head yeah. and the halo and it's like <laughs> he was he was he didn't talk at you he didn't talk down to you he talked to you right and it was like you could have agreed with some of his things you could have disagreed you could have come from a different background a di different culture but he saw people all as one and there was one episode, and I know we're going off topic, that I'll never forget of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood where he invited – it was um, the um, – I believe it was a male – I believe it was the not Mr. McFeely, the mailman. Yeah. The, uh, and he was uh, an African-American mailman that he actually asked him to join him to stick his feet into the pool and join him. So you had these two men, you know, that they were sitting – talking having their feet in the pool but having a conversation but being equal that they could share the same pool and i think like back in that time it was such a revelation right. that he didn't care it was like this is what i believe in this is what should be done and this is what's going to happen but he did it in a most utmost uh, respectful way and as i said I, I i i'm glad i had the privilege to to meet him because he was such a kind gentle soul Incredible, incredible. Yeah, and 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 to your point too, Mary. I wanted to kind of touch upon this a little bit. Like you were talking about how, yeah, like entertainment nowadays for kids is very hyper, and I completely agree with you. That's what that's an issue I have with a lot of these um, animated films now. They throw a million things at you at once, and you're right. When they're exposed to that early, they get used to that, and that's what they expect, and then it, it affects their attention span. It's even mm -hmm. even just with like everyday stuff like it i think it affects them in school because they can't focus it's everything has to be so fast they can't focus and then they get on the phone and they're on their little TikTok or whatever and it's like super fast everything is like a 10 minute mm -hmm. little short i mean not 10 minute like a 10 second little clip and if it's more than two minutes it's like oh i'm not i'm not gonna watch that whole thing you know and that's a big issue you know and and you I, as a parent you have to i think expose your kids to this stuff like the, like the Bambies, you know, and, the, and those kind of like that slow burn kind of movies. I'm kind so of convinced like, that's why they created Gorilla Glue. Well, <laughs> yeah, Gorilla <laughs> Glue, yeah, right, exactly. Exactly, exactly. Just like uh, Gorilla Glue the kid down so he has to sit and watch it. <laughs> now, can, I ask, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, do you guys remember, you probably don't, but I don't know. Um, there was a show on the Disney Channel. It was my favorite show on there growing up. Um, it was called Avonlea. Yes. I oh, yes. That. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a, yeah, it took place in the early 1900s, and it was sweet and, and uh, yeah, a period thing. And uh, it was about the kids and the adults, and I, me and my mom watched it. I think my dad watched it with us, too. I don't, I don't remember, but that was such a sweet movie and exposed me to stories like that. Uh, it's uh, for anyone who uh, who's ever seen the Anna Green Gables miniseries. It's basically a spinoff of that, um, and some of the the actors from that show up on the show. But um, I think that was on like maybe six or seven years. A very high quality. Um, they had amazing guest stars. They had Christopher Lloyd on there and Christopher Reeve and mm -hmm. um, Ned Beatty and people. They won Emmys for their for their. Uh, for their work on the show. So it was such an amazing show. And, you know, I was exposed to it at a young age. And so it, it helped sort of form my taste. And yeah. everything doesn't have to be 
modern to be enjoyable. Everything doesn't have to be, you know, you know, super fast and frantic and stuff. And I, I really miss things like that. Um, it's a show I love and it's, it's, it's hard to, um, find it's only on, um, something called gazebo TV, which you have to pay for, unfortunately, but I have all the, I own all the DVDs. Um, but so it's not on. So it was it a Disney production or was Disney Channel just the outlet it, that it, it was a Canadian production that Disney like bought the rights to basically. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. And then I think years later they aired it on Hallmark as well. Wow. Hallmark became like a big thing and just only wanted to produce their own shows. And it's funny. There's a show on um, Hallmark called When Calls the Heart, which is very very popular. And I watched like one episode. I'm like, eh, no, like it's okay, but it's it really lacks the realism that Avonlea has because these women are wearing makeup. They have highlights in their hair. They have mascara on. I'm like, oh, I'm like, okay, that's their vanity, I guess. But uh, <laughs> it's just not the same quality. But I so I feel bad when people are talking about how great it is. I'm like, oh, you haven't seen quality. <laughs> right exactly it, that, well, it's almost like uh we're speaking of glenn close it was almost like the uh sarah plain and tall mm -hmm. that that glenn close did it was like again like a period piece time of, you know where it wasn't like all glam glitz and glamour and all mm -hmm. that it was like because it was mm -hmm. set in that time zone it's like that's what brought the realism out yeah and that did those early disney channel years were magic they really were i mean i used to watch Avonlea was something. Uh, um, also, Ocean Girl. I don't know if you remember oh, Ocean, I love Girl. Ocean Girl. <laughs> Me too. Ocean <laughs> Girl and like the Mickey Mouse Club. I was big on the Mickey Mouse Club. And um, God, there was so much Adventures in Wonderland. I know. I know George. Yeah, I know I you that. were. That was a good yes. one. I and love then George, Adventures in Wonderland. Well, I, it I told someone about it who's like just a little bit older than me, and he had no idea uh, what it was. And I'm like, wow. yeah, well, it is a little wild, you know, the white rabbits on rollerblades and. You know the Tweedledee and Tweedledum are rappers, but I don't know. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. cute. Yeah. It's cute. I like it. Which uh, um, I forget the actor's name, but he was in a lot of Gary Marshall films. He was in the Princess Diaries. He played the neighbor, uh, Mister Robotussin. Okay, oh, sure. that's oh, yeah. White Rabbit. Is he the caterpillar? He that's or White that Rabbit. A white rabbit. That's oh. the white. That's the oh. white rabbit on the on the skates. Now the one who played the caterpillar. He played on, oh, he did a lot of cameos and a lot of shows. But the one, the only thing that I could think of, I'm dating myself, but I don't know. Obviously, I don't know if you guys watched That's So Raven or if you knew of the show. He oh, played no. the teacher that spat a lot. He would constantly spit oh. when he talked. <laughs> he was the caterpillar. Okay. Now, are all these, are like the White Rabbit and, and the Caterpillar, are they still with us? Or are they? The only one, they're all with us. The only one that's not with us, unfortunately, she just passed. Uh, a few years ago, who played? I forget the I forget her name. Uh, queen, right? Who played the Red Queen? Oh, um, I remember that. Which she yeah. actually played one of Oda Mae Brown's friends in Ghost. Wow, wow! Yeah. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, <laughs> Disney old school Disney Channel was such a gem. It was such a national treasure. It really was. Yeah. When I talk about the Disney Channel movies that I loved, it's not what people think about as Disney Channel like original movies. The right. original, original Disney Channel movies were like what I'm talking about. These like period, period pieces that were like super serious and they're really good and completely different from what came out, came after that. Like, and I love those, you know, one was about a Catholic girl and a Jewish girl during World War II and, you know, the, the racism and stuff. And, and the, there was like Heidi and, uh. Uh, my my favorite one is one no one remembers. <laughs> but again, it's like I had this weird obscure taste. But it was like a um, it was like a murder mystery, and it was called Bejeweled. Oh, okay. And it was about this woman who's like transporting these jewels to this museum in London, and they're stolen. And she enlists this detective she meets on the airplane, and like his two like wards, these two little kids, to help find the jewels and it's it's cute and funny and uh yeah very 90s and no one remembers that movie <laughs> i don't remember that movie that's interesting yeah. that's interesting but you know so it has emma sands which she's she was sort of big in the 90s 
and um, Dennis Lawson, who played Wedge in Star Wars. Nice. Yeah, nice. That's, that's okay. His, yeah. And is that you on Disney? Find, you can find that on YouTube. You can find that on YouTube. I was just going to ask you that. Okay, so YouTube has that. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's not the best quality, but it, it looks okay. And it's it's just a fun movie. I love, I'm a big fan of like uh, murder mystery movies. So nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, again, all the things I watched as I was young informed my taste. I would watch that and I'd watch like Murder She Wrote with my grandma or something. So. <laughs> Murder She Wrote. <laughs> the great uh, Angela Lansbury. Amazing. Yeah. 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 Disney Legend 100%. But Marianne, it was an absolute pleasure having you on. We will definitely have you back on again. Talk, we'll talk all kinds of stuff. We'll talk TV, movies. If you want to talk parks, come back and talk parks. We can do that too. So absolutely. But uh, if you could let everybody at home know where they can uh, find you on social media. You can find me on Twitter uh, under the Girly Nerd and on Instagram under the Girly Nerd blog. There it is. And I will link everything down below. So I'll make and, it easy. Uh, you can also find my writing on Wells of Geeks. Everyone, please go follow Wells of Geeks. We're still a little site, uh, you know, trying to compete with the bigger competitors. But uh, we have wonderful, wonderful writers and completely us. No AI. No AI. Nice. Perfect. So also send me that link and I'll, I'll put that in below sure. as well, Marion. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. No, absolutely. And the Italiano, if you could let everybody at home know, uh, know where they find you on social media. Absolutely. You can find me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Disney George. You could also find me on Instagram under the Disney Italiano. And, of course, you'll find me here on my home base at Orange Grove, 55, with Citrus Corner, with all that sweet, juicy, but sometimes sticky Disney news and info. Perfect, perfect. Comment down below with all your favorite 90s era live action Disney movies. Or if you want to talk um, animation, you can do that too in the comments. If you want to talk Disney Channel and the old school Disney Channel shows, <laughs> whatever you want to discuss in the comments down below. Thank you all so, so much for watching this episode of The Orange Nerd Show. And until next time, see you later, everybody.